Good morning. I'm Dr. Tom McGilvery, the Chief of Cardiac Surgery and Thoracic Transplant Surgery here at Houston Methodist. And it is my honor, uh, pleasure, and privilege to introduce our Grand Round speakers this morning. Dr. Mark Ruel and Dr. Ben Somer have come down from Ottawa, Canada uh, and gave us a terrific presentation on minimally invasive cardiac surgery, a team-based approach. Uh, and uh, we learned an awful lot about the development and the implementation of these very complicated operations. Uh, not only can they be done, uh, and they, but they can be done very well as we learned this morning. So I, I have a few, a few questions for, for you guys. Uh, again, thank you very much for a great presentation this morning. Uh, as it, it was said, cardiac surgery is the quintessential team sport. And uh, I was very intrigued to hear uh, ben, your comments about the importance of the anesthesiologist. Certainly those of us who have been doing surgery for a while know that. Uh, but I, I'm, 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 I'm curious to learn more about that. Uh, how, how do you, what are the metrics by which you assess uh, the qualities of a, of a cardiac anesthesiologist? It's, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak today. It was very much appreciated. Uh, to answer your question, um, there are, it's not a, one thing in particular that I like to look at. It's, um, it's a mix of many. Uh, I would probably have to categorize all of it under uh, many different small details. So those who take care of all the small details, every last one of them, no matter how minute they may look individually, the sum of all parts will usually come out in the end. And it's a difference between doing your job and doing your job that much better or in a more negative way, avoiding sloppiness. And if you do that, it's, it's, it's noticeable to those around you and it's noticeable internally for your own reflection and self-assessment. So that every small detail counts. As you said, Tom, I mean, surgery is the, uh, it's quite a team sport and it's more than surgery per se, it's, it's surgery and anesthesia. And, and nursing and everything, perioperative care that relates to it and even preparation for surgery, prehab type of concept which is more and more being uh, discussed as highly relevant to the outcome of our patients. Uh, there's no question that it, we all know this uh, as surgeons and anesthesiologists that the OR is a tremendously social environment. And, and when I say social, I don't mean like uh, chatting about the weekend or, or plans for the evening or but in terms of interactions, and, and it's a little bit akin, I like to compare it to uh, uh, crew resource management, you know, that's being used in, in the airline industry, or even bridge resource management that's being used in, in uh, nautical and naval safety. And, and, and it, there is, you know, a chain of uh, interactions, uh, commands, but also uh, communications with uh, closing the loop around communications. Uh, uh, and we were talking about this yesterday uh, at our, our faculty dinner, and it was uh, very interesting to, to see the parallels between the OR, the importance of the outcomes, and what we can learn from CRM, BRM, and also the military in some way. Uh, not to say that it's the, the, the same context and obviously not the same uh, purpose, but, but I think we're all in it together as a team, and the team has to function. And, and rightly or wrongly, I would argue that the, the surgeon uh, has to see herself or himself a, a, as the captain of, of the ship and, and with a very, very strong ally in the anesthesiologist. And, and, and the team will react very much to the uh, uh, moods or, or to perhaps to the disturbances that a surgeon may bring that are even, God forbid, outside of, of the realm of, of what the, the patient uh, is undergoing. And I think that aspect is tremendously understudied and tremendously important. You know, our anesthesia colleagues are doing a great job at developing these studies. And certainly there are some studies emerging around that. And I think the next decade is gonna see more and more of those. Thank you. This being said, uh, Tom, I wanted to thank you also, like, and echo Ben for, for the invitation to these grand rounds. It's a wonderful uh, honor for us to be at Methodist, uh, the BK. This is a, a fantastic uh, institution, which has, has uh, a huge, uh, uh, testament that's been given to cardiovascular surgery and to vascular surgery in many other fields so it's a historical institution 
uh, and it's also a very active, a very current, and a very future bright uh, type of institution. And uh, we also are very mindful uh, and, and very uh, uh, honored by the focus on education that your uh, your institution has, and it certainly is well known for this. It's our I think we've been here uh, twice before. Uh, we're, we consider ourselves uh, friends, and, and I think it's reciprocal. And certainly, it's a it's a wonderful opportunity for us to continue to interact with you guys. Well, the, the both of you are very gracious about that, and there's a lot of gratitude from us. The uh, the Methodist community is very grateful that you've come down to to teach us. Uh, as you alluded to, the this is Dr. DeBakey's house, and he was a very forward-thinking surgeon and really brought new innovative uh, techniques to the rest of the world. And um, I think it's one of the things that has happened over the years is that coronary revascularization surgery, uh, I would say, is one of the most underrated, underappreciated procedures. It does so much good for so many people that we take it for granted. And you all have really taken it to another level. Uh, as I was looking at your presentation, and as somebody who's done a fair amount of coronary vascularization, the ability to do multi-vessel grafting, uh, total uh, revascularization through these small incisions, uh, it really is quite impressive. I, I would imagine that that doesn't just happen. You don't go from being a full sternotomy surgeon to a minimal access total revascularization surgeon. Please walk us through how you, how you approach that, how you do that uh, as, a, as a team. Well, thanks Tom. I, I think you, you, your, point, your point is well taken that the coronary revascularization <coughs> is tremendously important and perhaps underrated. Although we are now starting to see as a community that it's, there's a somewhat of a resurgence and certainly uh, a renewed interest in, in making it uh, better. Uh, our competitor or for lack of a better term, or the alternative to coronary revascularization is, uh, is uh, percutaneous coronary interventions. And there's a conceptual difference between the two, and they both have their roles uh, according to the acuteness of presentation, as you know very well, and, and also the extent of disease, and, and whether it's focal versus a multi-vessel diffuse disease, etc. Uh, there's no question, this being said from our, my interventional cardiologist friends, uh, that cabbage bypass surgery remains the most robust and durable uh, approach to doing this. So I think we have to uh, use a stepwise incremental process towards making bypass surgery less invasive. And you and your colleagues have been part of this, we've done our small part as well. And, and what I try to illustrate here, it's not without necessarily giving a recipe, uh, enhancing the importance of having a culture and, and a supportive culture. You know, we surgeons have, uh, and, and Dr. Beke, Dr. DeBakey was not like this. He, he really believed in providing the education around the message of all the operations that he was designing. And this is probably one of the reasons why this institution is so focused on education. But we have to be re to remember that we're, we're part of a large community. And what's important, as I always say to the trainee teams that come visit us, what's important is not that I do it and that I do it with Ben or that we in Ottawa do it. What's important is that you do it. And that's what I tell the trainees. And, and we have to support each other uh, in terms of developing ways to make bypass surgery a better operation, a more durable operation, and a less invasive operation. <clears throat> and I think we have, <clears throat> bypass surgery is a product that's not reproduced uh, physiologically, therapeutically in any other fashion. There's no way to come in an endovascular approach and create a new artery. This has not happened yet. There were attempts around arteriovenous fistulas, as you know, but these have not uh, these have not come forward to uh, to successful practice. So it's still a very very robust uh, way of providing revascularization to the heart by simply replacing the diseased arteries, especially if they're diseased quite extensively. Um, and I think you know going in a stepwise, there are multiple ways to do this. You can go from a uh, uh, not using the heart-lung machine, you can <clears throat> go towards maybe minimizing the 
the size of the incision or the way that the incisions perform or do both. And, and I think all approaches have to be encouraged. Uh, towards the greater, goal, the greater goal of having a better, more durable, and less invasive operation. It's funny, I was, uh, Mark, I was <coughs> planning on asking you uh, to make a pitch to cardiologists why they would want someone to get a PCI as opposed to surgical revascularization. And as I listened, uh, as I listened to you uh, now and this morning, uh, I, I would say the pitch should be made to cardiac surgeons. and and that uh, why they and their team should embrace minimally invasive cardiac surgery because we get the benefit of the surgical revascularization, avoiding a sternotomy and all of the trappings that come with that. I was very impressed with uh, how quickly your patients get back to full activity and, and that the limitations that they have are really much less than they do with surgery, so you get the benefit of the surgical revascularization without the pitfalls of the traditional open surgery. So uh, what, please give us, give us your best pitch to the surgeons out there that are, that are listening in. Well, uh, I agree, and I think your pitch is, is the best one that can be provided. I don't think I can do better than that, but you, you're absolutely right. Sternotomy is a, a tremendously powerful operation and useful and reproducible and provides great exposure. Uh, yet we perform it in, in patients who are often older who may have osteoporotic process that are already going on and then we expect it to, to heal uh, without any issues in everyone. And we know very well that this doesn't happen. There are patients who have uh, chronic pain, not only from sternotomy, any incision, including a small thoracotomy may lead to chronic pain syndromes. Uh, but uh, as you said, the uh, price to pay, the invasiveness uh, toll of around bypass surgery can be estimated to be somewhere around three to six months. So what we're trying to do is, and many other groups in the world have embraced this, uh, is, is trying to preserve the high quality product for the patient that bypass surgery constitutes, while at the same time decreasing the, the invasiveness. And you're absolutely right, this, this should be something that the entire cardiac surgical community should uh, get into and embrace. I can add another element to that as well. If you look 10 years ago, the data for octogenarians having bypass surgery was, was positive. We're now looking at people in their 90s. Mm -hmm. So there's inherent bias. There has to be inherent bias amongst the cardiologists who want to do PCI because they're old and frail and so on. If I go back to your first question on the team, it would be, it would be um, inappropriate for me to say that my role is important and no other physician is. But if you look at your team and you expand it to your preoperative geri pre and post -op geriatrician and your critical care specialist, all of these minds from looking at the problem from a different perspective can achieve that goal in addition to the surgical correction. And if you expand it even more and more, it's, I'll be very interested to see if they're that much different at the end of the game in terms of recovery. Well, I was very impressed, Ben, with your presentation and that uh, the focus on collaboration and communication and that the amount of preparation and, the, and, and how while Mark and the surgeons are focused and uh, engaged in the operative field and how uh, the, the value and the importance that the anesthesiologist plays in keeping the communication going and having the team, the rest of the big team in the operating room uh, working. I mean, I, I think that uh, uh, hats off to that. Thank you very much. I, it's, it's, maybe it's me, maybe it's not, but I, I don't know how I could provide an anesthetic without understanding the surgical procedure. It doesn't match, so. Well, this has really been terrific. I'd like to, again, thank Dr. Rule and Dr. Som, uh, Somer for coming down and really teaching us uh, so much about minimally invasive cardiac surgery. And uh, this is also part of the uh, re-evolution course that we're running uh, over the next couple of days here at Methodist. Thanks very much.